my far left is the guy who started the whole digital revolution. And let's face it, he is the guy who started it. And uh, when he one day goes to the pearly gates, he can say, I invented Final Cut Pro. And they'll let him right in. <laughs> Please welcome chief architect and creator of Final Cut Pro, Randy Ubelos. Lights up, please, lights up, lights up. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Wow. Thanks. That's pretty cool. <laughs> no, honestly, uh, uh, the people in this audience, uh, as well as around the world and around everywhere, uh, were affected by what you did. And uh, a lot of us talk about changing the world, and this guy sitting next to me actually did change the world. And along with some of the people he was sitting with uh, A lot tonight. of the people that I was sitting with. A lot it was of, not yeah. just me. Yeah, n yeah, no one does it alone, but uh, still, uh, the, uh, somebody has to take credit. Somebody has to put the name at the top, <laughs> and the name at the top is Randy Ublow. So it's, it's really cool. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, Ten years ago, I went up to your house, and I think it was Cupertino? Los Altos, California, yeah. Was it Los ne Altos? It's, it's, it's right the next, same thing, right? next right? to Cupertino, yeah. Yeah, it's all this, like, suburban stuff. Yeah. And you and... Uh, um, now, the, the cool thing about his house was that it is the most, it was the most immaculate place that I ever seen in my life. You had to take your shoes off when you walked through the door. There was not a speck of dust anywhere. His husband, Rick, was at a table talking uh, landscaping with a, with a couple, and, uh, and it was, you know, beautiful documents on, the, on this, this absolutely right. gorgeous table. And then I, I put a, uh, a microphone on, on the kitchen table to talk to Randy, but he had to put a coaster under the... <laughs> Is that so crazy? <laughs> a coaster under the... Oh, by the way, uh, did somebody take the water? <laughs> Was that... uh, Oh, do you want some water? I'm fine. Yeah, okay. Fine, so anyway, you. anyway, we, we, we had a long conversation that ended up in uh, one of our Super Meat magazines back in 2008. It was, it was, 10, it was 2008. So let's start at the beginning. Sure. Um, and by the way, there's going to be no kind of controversy tonight. I'm not going to ask the hard questions. I don't expect you to ask the hard questions, too. This conversation is going to be about the early days of Randy all the way up through, hopefully, Final Cut Pro 5. We don't have a lot of time to do that, but I'll try to do as much as I can. But uh, let's learn something about uh, who this guy is and, and why he did what he did. And uh, one of the things you might not know is that he grew up in Miami, and he was one of the AV guys in high school. <laughs> of course he was one of the AV guys in high school. And, have a, and you worked at a computer store in high school, yep, right? I did. When I was in uh, a senior in high school, I was working in the afternoons at a bike shop in Miami. Uh, selling and then... Wait a minute, a bike shop? Bite shop, B-Y-T-E. Oh, oh, the one of those kind. <laughs> yeah. Selling and then repairing uh, Apple II computers. Why? I mean, what, what, what interested you in... Because it was, more f it was a more fun job than being a bag boy at Winn-Dixie or washing planes at Tamiami Airport, which were my two previous jobs. <laughs> Seriously, that was the only reason? Well, I just, it was something I was, I was interested in. Um, and, uh, yeah. I think a friend was actually, I think a friend was working there and got it kind of through a friend, was looking for something to do in the afternoons, and yeah. So you're in high school and you're working at a computer store in high school, and I, I think you told me this back when we had that interview at your house, that you actually started a company in high school, when or I, was that? That was when I, when I, so when I started college, a friend of mine and I uh, started a company. University I, of Miami. <clears throat> University of Miami. Um, so one of the things, I, I started te teaching myself how to program, and at that time, all the software in the store was copy protected, and we wanted to have copies of the games and things to be able to show on the show floor. And I started kind of reverse engineering the way the copy protection works so we could actually make copies Ooh. of the software to have in the store. Was that legal? Uh, gray area. <laughs> 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 um, 
but so then I ended up writing some software, which I ended up calling Nibbles Away. It was a what disc was it, copy program. What was it called again? Nibbles Away. Nibbles Away. And it was a disc copy software. And then there was a guy that, that I knew from, from the store who saw an opportunity to sell it. And so we started a company. Um, so this is why you're at uh, University of Miami. And did you graduate at University of Miami? I did not. You I, did not. Uh, I, you're I, like a Bill Gates kind of guy. <laughs> I dropped out after my third year because I was just... The, the company, we started doing contract software. We were writing games for the VIC-20. We wrote a uh, spreadsheet and a word processor for the Commodore 64. And I was just having way more fun doing that than doing, like, punch cards to program some, you know, uh, mainframe at school that was just boring. And um, so I was just, it was much more interesting the stuff I was doing at work. And so it wasn't like I would, didn't want to do anything. It was just, school was just getting in the way. And so, so how long were you at uh, Miami? Like one year? Three years. Two, three years. Three years, yeah. Three years. So <laughs> your mom must have been really proud of you one year before graduation. <laughs> my parents were not really thrilled. Uh, it took my mom, I don't know, a year or two to kind of figure out that it was going to be okay. My dad, it was longer than that because he was very just, oh, you need that degree, you need that degree. What would your dad do? <clears throat> he was an electrical engineer. He was an electrical engineer. So and, you had a little bit of... And uh, that's what I thought I was going to do. I, I mean, my... my uh, I was doing computer engineering, which was electrical engineering and software design, um, or you know, computer software in college. And I, up with, from the time I was four until I was, you know, got into college, if you would ask me what I was going to be when I grew up, it was electrical engineer. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and, and what does an electrical engineer do? It's, it's, it's not unsimilar to what you were doing. Well, it's, it's designing hardware, okay. designing circuits oh, okay. and putting them together. And my dad taught me all about electronics, and I was wiring up circuits and stuff when I was in sixth grade and like designing my own stuff and building it. And do some people just have that talent or do they need a father to I, teach them? I think lots of kids have lots of different talents. It's like, and to someone where it's not their center of their focus, anything else seems like magic. It's like, to me, someone who can sit down at a piano and just make up some music, to me that's, that's absolute magic. Someone who can sit down with a piece of, of clay and mold something is absolute magic to me. And the software stuff, that's just like solving a puzzle, and so it just kind of makes sense to me. Okay, so you had this uh, this software company that you said did pretty well. I mean, you were actually making okay. you were making a living. You yep. could buy your own apartment or rent your I, own I, apartment. Yeah. I was you could myself. buy your own food and mm -hmm. things like that, <laughs> <laughs> which is unusual for <laughs> these days, especially if you live in sure. the big cities like Los Angeles. Yeah. And um, but everything was going pretty well, mm -hmm. but the the partner that you were with was not necessarily the right partner it was we had um, we started doing different programs we did a, a an Apple II emulator the Mac had come out we did a thing called two in a Mac which was an Apple II emulator on the Mac did okay we started doing a PC version of it um, we were just doing a lot of little contract things that there wasn't any they were never gonna really turn into anything more than just a particular job and it was always this constant like you know keep the next job coming in, keep the next job coming in and one of the things that I learned years later is that working with a group of smart people is so much more enjoyable than working by yourself because you're just figuring it all out by yourself. When you've got smart people around, you all get to bounce ideas off of each other, and it's it's the result is way more than the, than just the you know the one plus one plus one. Yeah, but sometimes when you have a lot of smart people around, you're always arguing. <laughs> the right smart people. <laughs> the right smart people. <laughs> <laughs> because you either get the the arguing or the ones who are just say no to everything, and so it's the getting the right smart people. But you, you were entrepreneurial, but you liked to, to be in a team. Well, I learned that later, that I liked to be in a team. When I first moved out to California, so, well, so the software company we had, we had moved it up to North Carolina, because my right. partner's wife wanted to move out kind of into the country, and I said, all right, fine, I'll move up there. Um, but I was kind of bored, and we had written some software for a company called Media Vision. It was actually a division of Activision. It was this thing called, um, uh, open it, which was essentially a very light version of like a PDF. It was a print print driver that would print to a digital file that you could then look at. And so this company, Mediagenic, which was a business products division of Activision, the game company, wanted to, to sell it, and they were selling it for us. And just one afternoon, I, I called them up, and, or I sent an email, and I said, do you know anybody who's looking for a program out in California? And I got a call back about 10 minutes later saying, is this you? And I secretly... Did a, I was I told my partner that I was going to visit my mom. And I actually <laughs> flew out to California, had this interview, and I got my mom's like, oh, Steve's looking for you. Um, <laughs> and 
gave him a ton of notice, but he still sort of freaked out. But uh, moved out to California, didn't really know anybody. Um, and then uh, Activision closed the division about six months later. And they kind of gave me a position in the game side of things. I don't think they wanted to let me go, but I was just kind of bored. And a friend called and said that uh, he knew someone at a company called Supermac that was doing uh, graphics cards for the Mac. You and guys, uh, any, anybody here old enough to remember Super Mac? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Super Mac, I mean, they had the big 20, 20 inch monitors, 21 inch monitors. Yeah. They were doing some of the first 24 bit color on a Mac. Uh, their space was that two or three years ahead of Apple, what Apple was going to build into the machine. Yeah. So they always had to be. I mean, they forward. were a kick ass company. Mm -hmm. And um, so I started. going to be one of my questions down the line. Why the hell do you just stay with those guys? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Well, so I was doing the, I was working on the, they wanted to, they had all these different uh, pieces of firmware for all the different cards that were sort of all over the place, and they wanted to bring them together. And I was working on that, and then they started. They did this uh, thing, the Supermatch Color Calibrator. Supermatch. Supermatch Color yeah. Calibrator. So it was, I think it was Supermatch. That was a little suction cup thing that you stick on your screen, and you hit the button, and it would go through, and it would like Seriously? figure out. Yeah. Oh, cool. And they were going to get, they, um, uh, they had hired an engineer, a contract engineer, to come in, and. Um, design the firmware for the thing, and uh, so they got we were going to get me to do the um, the, uh, the software for the user interface on screen, and the marketing guys just they were like oh they wanted it to be just you know like fancy over the top kind of color and just kind of show off what the cards could do, and I got that stuff all designed, and then the engineer that was doing the hardware didn't really know what he was doing, and so when one of the QA guys and I sat down over a weekend, he had been going for a couple of months all this equipment he was renting. And we just sat down and just were like, well, it doesn't seem like he's doing it the right way. So we, I sat down and kind of coded it up and in about a week we kind of had the firmware running for the thing. So he didn't know what you, he was doing, but you knew what you, was do, well, you were doing. I had done but a lot of would, microcontroller oh, okay. stuff. I had oh. done, done low-level microcontroller programming. I love that kind of stuff. And instead of a logic analyzer, I just soldered two LEDs onto the microcontroller and would make the LEDs turn on and off. And I could tell how far it got in the code and kind of got the thing up and running. <laughs> And we ended up shipping it. So why um, is it guys like you can do that kind of stuff, and I can't even use Keynote? No, seriously. I mean, it just drives me nuts. It's like guys are good at math. Why? I've just why are they good at math? I, I've, I'm not necessarily super. I, I mean, basic math stuff, algebra. No, but you know what? Everybody but, out there thinks you're like super smart. <laughs> so you're Susan, I, I you? like knowing how things work. I've always liked to know what was inside of it. I mean, my mom talks about how when I was four, I started taking things apart, and when I got to be up at five, I would start putting them back together. I've always liked to look under the covers and know how something start, you know, how it gets from one place to another, how that stuff works. You know, I've always loved physics. Me and too. And stuff but like it that. never ended up <laughs> create. It never created. Final Cut Pro. I was the same sorry. guy with uh, with Tinker Toys and, and and everything else. I would I would tear things apart. I would build them. Mm -hmm. I was always pretty good at that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but somehow somewhere math got in the way, and that's exactly <laughs> where you you know are guys like you, engineers like you, um, you you go off the charts and you create this this extraordinary just stuff. Been just doing all stuff right, so we uh, all right. I want to uh, skip a little bit. So you come out to California. You take the job with uh, uh, Supermac. Yep. And Supermac is this just this uh, amazing company uh, who made a few mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, in 1990, I got it in my notes, and I could be wrong here. You, um, they wanted you to write this software for this card, this Nubis card. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Called um, digital uh, film. Called digital film, which is watch this, folks. See if it works. Well, yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The digital that film. thing. That thing. And it was five thousand dollars, though, right? Yep. They were starting to work on that, and so. This is, and they wanted you to write test they software. Wanted, they wanted some software. You know, it was oh, we're going to have digital videos sitting on the computer. Now, what are you going to do with it? So I started like kind of specking out what you know, it would look like if you had a couple of tracks and a transition in between and had, you know, some soundtracks. And I, I was funny, and, and when you were asking me about this stuff over the last couple of weeks, I went and I found, I actually have the original spec that uh, was, it was called Scrunch, was the original software. Crunch was the code name for, the, <laughs> for this board. And Captain Crunch was the name of this, so Crunch. And then Scrunch was software for Crunch. So Scrunch was the code name for the original 
uh, that was the original name, and then the, then the um, it became Real Time was the kind of name for it as a product. And that's Real Time R E A L R E E L. -E -L. Right. Okay. And so I started working on this in the engineering department. The marketing department was convinced that they were going to work with um, a company called VideoFX that was doing software for uh, for video stuff, and but they were just going off. They wanted to, I don't know. I just thought it was kind of an, an odd sort of thing. So my boss just said, "Keep working on it. Keep working on it." And in about I don't know about four months, I kind of had the thing up and running. Three four months, months, something like that. Jeez. I had enough of it up and running, and I remember we had there was some show that was at in. Uh, uh, the Fairmont in San Jose, and actually remember showing it. The marketing department kind of got a, saw it before that, and then they wanted to start showing it to people, and they saw the reaction. And all of a sudden, they were like, "Oh, hey, maybe we can like do something with this." So, <laughs> worked on it for the rest through the rest of the year, um, and then, uh, but uh, they had gotten out of the software business, and they didn't want to get back into the software business. So it was clear they were going to sell it off to some place. Uh, didn't know where that was going to be. Uh, there were, were talks going on with Adobe, and I didn't know it until later, but there was this agreement that Adobe wouldn't talk to me about going to work for Adobe. That was part of the agreement, because they wanted me to stay at Supermac. So they weren't allowed to say anything. What I found out later is... So was Randy Ubelos known, or was real-time known, or what? I mean, Nothing was known outside the company, but to Adobe, they saw this as, as okay. something... But this um, is test software. This wasn't well, but no, it was becoming a product. At oh, this it point. was becoming a product. And then at, okay. I think it was May or something like that at Digital World of uh, that's yeah well, down here in Los Angeles. Yes, came down. I remember being around. It's a, it's at a hotel around a pool, right? Yeah, like the there was a whole bunch of rooms. There was yeah. like twelve rooms. Exactly. Little rooms. And so we had a whole room, and you know, people were editors coming in right. and seeing this thing, and they're like, "Wait, what are you guys showing here?" They're like, "This is because Avid was like two doors over." Yeah. I remember going to dinner. This is 89 or 90? This would have been 90, uh, this would have been 91. Okay. 91, uh, mid-91. And um, mid-91. Going okay. to dinner. This is I important, mid-91. Dinner, okay. I think, I think with Bill Warner, I think it was like some of the, the people at, uh, yeah. at this, Avid. I love this story. There was a, an editor named Steve Cohen who came yeah. in and this kind is, of- Who's been here many times. Looked at it and he, he said, so have you ever seen like a, a Canon editing, film editing? And I was like, no. And so he took me over to, uh, I think, Corolco. Um, and you saw one of these. And I saw, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I kind of saw some of this stuff for the first time. And it was kind of interesting to, to see. And it, it was interesting, you know, seeing the, the cloth bins of film and stuff, you know, sticking down yeah. into it and the very physical and nature what, of movie stuff. And moviolas and things like that? Yeah, that, yeah, I mean, yeah moviolas and, and, and a So this a is camera. a guy who, who, who wrote all this wonderful software for, for editors and who didn't know any. <laughs> <laughs> I had done taped it, like, we had, in high school, we had three quarter inch tape decks. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we well, spin it. when I finished, we actually had an editing controller. But before that, we didn't even have an editing controller. It was all done by using the counts on the on the uh, decks and backing them up and zeroing the counts and hit playing forward and you know insert edit. And you actually hand drew, according to my notes here, a bunch of diagrams based on what you did with those three quarter decks. And that that's what led and to that's some what of the led specifications. To yeah, exactly. Just you know, you have two tracks running along and different pieces coming in and out at different times, and that was kind of where the... Maybe the I missed it, track. but how long did it take to write the software to where before it was uh, sold? Uh, real time took about 11 months. 11 so months. Premiere 1.0 was and about it became, 11 months. And it became real It was real relabeled software. as Premiere 1.0. It became a real product. Yep. It was, it it was started as, as testing, but it became a real product. Yep. Were yep. you happy with it? Yeah, I was pretty happy with it. And, I was, I was, was actually the... Was the, still your target audience uh, just in testing this, this card? No, no, it was, I mean, now, then, so in, in between, so the digital film card actually slipped and was getting later and later, and they had come up, figured out that they could do with some of the hardware they were working at, they came up with the video spigot card, which was a much less expensive card that they were going to ship. And so um, having this software at Adobe where, you know, that you could uh, edit the stuff that you uh, pulled in with the video spigot card, Seemed like a good thing. And that video spigot card was kind of a. Uh, it's like a four ninety five. It, it, it was. It was like yeah. It was a, that it was, was a five thousand dollar card, and uh, this th card could do six forty by four eighty, uh, thirty frames a second. So basically, one field, thirty frames a second, which was huge at the time. The video spigot card could do one sixty by one twenty at thirty frames a second, 
which was still at the time but like, it, wow, but, look but, what I can do. Look still, how smooth that it is. It sold like 50,000. Sold huge, huge numbers yeah, of them. Yeah, because it was $500. Yeah, something that you couldn't do before. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of people did. The thing that was kind of funny was that, um, like I said, Adobe was not allowed to talk to me about going over there. And um, I know, I love that. So yes. they actually... They actually were having me interview some engineers that they were saying, well, we think this guy would be good to work on this. Can you talk to him? And at one point, I, I said I wanted to have lunch with a couple of guys. And they had two people come to lunch so they could corroborate the story. And it was like small talk, whatever. And they were like, okay, so. I was like, I would like to know if there are any opportunities for employment at Adobe. And they looked at each other and like, yeah, that works, that works. Because <laughs> so, I had to ask them. They couldn't ask me. And I found out they had been bringing in people that they thought would annoy me, to, that they were going to be working on the software that I had been working on, that I wouldn't want the software to go to that. I learned this later on, and I thought it was pretty sneaky. But, but, but why? You, were, you made a good product over at uh, Super Mac? Did you just think nothing's going to happen? I wanted to keep working it? on it. I really was enjoying what it was. Okay, and so and they didn't weren't going to do it. any more software, so you needed to move on. Well, 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 but whatever they were going to do at Super Mac, I wanted to keep working on this software. Like, it was only version one. There was still so much more to do with it. No, I mean, same. Why'd you go to Adobe? I mean, it's just because they allowed you to work more. Because they were going to carry the for product forward, and they were going to put a bunch of money behind it, and they were going to put. And Super Mac was not going to do that. Correct. Okay. Correct. Super Mac was selling it off. So we, yeah. we've had these emails going back and forth for like two weeks. I'm going, I'm confused, Randy. I'm confused, Randy. I'm confused. <laughs> it's hard so, remembering back this far about the time frame sometimes. Yeah. So, um, by the way, so, all right. So Adobe buys this, yep. buys you at the, uh, at the same time. And also at the same time, QuickTime ships for yep. the first time ever. This is December 1991. You moved to Adobe in January 1992. Yep. January, and February, right around everything there. Everything changes, and of course, the this is this is real time. What we're going to look at this is Adobe Premiere yeah. 1.0 commercial, and this is essentially real time from uh, from Super Mac. It's and it's like I hit the space bar, yep. right, Brian? Yep. Space bar. <laughs> space bar. Okay. So. Yeah, see, that's, <laughs> now that's 1992, and that's a product. Yep. That's a product that you can do some really cool stuff with. I mean, that had, that had everything. That had little special effects and <laughs> transitions and all sorts of really Transition good stuff. Transition window with it. all the little icons yeah. that animated when you brought it forward. <laughs> Where'd you get all that? I mean, you wanted to put everything into this, this, this little product? There's just lots of ideas that came together. I mean, like all the special Where'd effects Where'd the ideas were just... come from? Did you see it in commercials? Who was your muse? I mean, a lot of this. Or what the, was your muse? The transitions. It was just seeing. I remember uh, there was a empty list of standard transitions, really? circles and wipes and and things. And so I sort of went down through that list and um, mimicked a bunch of them. I don't know if it was in one o or two o, but there was the video toaster. Did a lot of transitions. Uh, everybody were, loved the video right. toaster. But the video toaster had this cool way of doing transitions where they would use a gradient file. So they would use a still image that was a gradient, and they would do this thing where they would basically run from the black to the white of the image and run a wipe line along that sort of gradient curve. And I just I looked at it and sort of figured out how to do that, and then we came up with our own gradients so we could have those same sort of um, very you know organic looking wipes and things. Um, in I think probably version two or version three. Okay, it uh, it, it was an instant hit. Right, 1.0. I think it did pretty well. I mean, they. The, the, I don't know specific numbers. That was not my. Well, no, but that's but. what I've read. It was an instant hit with production mm -hmm. houses and hobbyists. Mm -hmm. Production and houses mainly on the the kind of prototyping, uh, planning side of things. And you tried to sell it to. You came down here several times to try to sell it to Hollywood. Um, uh, Spent a lot of time down here at a bunch of different studios. They were using it for a lot of different um, comping sorts of things and. Um, but yeah, there were a lot of interest, a lot of interest. Tim Myers and I spent a bunch of time down here. Was Hollywood years. ever your end game? I mean, was that? No, but it was, th that was a great source of learning, uh, of getting ideas on 
new things that to do in the software yeah. and, and additional capabilities to add to it. That was also a great source so, of information. So you were at Adobe, was it just Randy Ublos or was there anybody else helping you? Uh, so version 1.0 I wrote by myself at, um, at, Macromedia. at Macromedia. Version 2, there was another guy. Or, uh, yeah, uh, Super Mac. <laughs> Super Mac. Um, at um, version 2, there was another guy, Nick Schlott, who came on and he wrote the titling module that was uh, part of version 2. We had a titler and I did the rest. It was the two of us as engineers. And we had a bunch of QA and we had Tim and I think some other people from marketing. Um, version 3, there was another guy, Brian Ressler, who came in and he did the PowerPC port because that was right when that was happening. And then version four, uh, Brian and I and Nick, and I'm not sure if there's anybody else uh, engineering-wise that was on Good that. Good Lord, so you, the, the biggest team you had was what, four people? Five, three, four, something like that. Yeah. Well, Lauren Carey was, was working with us. Uh, he, he came in to do a lot of the device control stuff. And uh, how many people maximum at Apple uh, uh, did you have? Which point? At, like at say, let's let's just say app Final Cut Pro five. Oh, I don't know. There had to have been 